Good afternoon to you all. Being in Rome involves some unique uh, opportunities and uh, responsibilities. Uh, one of which is to try to uh, help the uh, European and global evangelical family uh, to address uh, Roman Catholic theology and Roman Catholicism as a whole from a theological point of view. And uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why we, uh, five years ago we launched the uh, Rome Scholars Network is a week-long seminar taking place in Rome, second half of June, each year pre-COVID, um, to gather scholars, international scholars, leaders of churches, organizations, willing to wrestle with uh, the challenge of addressing Catholicism from theological point of view, a Protestant evangelical point of view, and gathering wisdom uh, from the, the best scholars around the world who are actually working on this topic. And so sharing and learning and equipping and uh, maturing in uh, assessing uh, Roman Catholicism. And so as part of this uh, work, uh, more connected to the forum, we also offer the year-round mentoring program on engaging Catholicism. It's a year-long uh, mentoring program for a group of people. Last year, we had 14 uh, people from around the world. This year, we have a, another similar group. And uh, uh, I'm sure that Steve can send the link to in the chat line in order for you to have more information, just in case you would like to join this year-round mentoring program. And out of the Rome Scholars Network, we hope to encourage more thinking, uh, theological work on Catholicism from an evangelical point of view. And uh, I'm also privileged of being the leader of the learning community of the Union School of Theology. Uh, next year, we're going to have uh, two students at the master's level and four students for the GD program. Plus, I am co-supervising a couple of PhD students working on uh, Catholic-related topics, such as Mariology, and post-Vatican II missiology. So there are many opportunities for uh, people you might know or are interested in engaging in this kind of field to connect with us and we'll be happy to uh, talk and to help if we can. Again, for this opportunity to talk about Berlamin and I choose this topic and I thank uh, Dirk and Michael for accepting it. Uh, for a number of reasons. One is that uh, it is his, uh, it's the fourth centenary of his death. And as this year in particular, uh, for our evangelical memory, we remember the first centenary of John Stott's birth and uh, the first centenary of B.B. Warfield's death and even Herman Bavings. Uh, death. We also have the opportunity to look at important anniversaries in uh, the Catholic camp in order to make use of these opportunities. I will present this paper even to a Catholic audience at the Gregorian University, uh, the, the university in which, uh, I mean, the, the grandparent the grandmother of the present day Gregorian University, where even Cardinal Bedlerman taught the Roman College, as it was called then. But also, it is important to address Bellarmine because Bellarmine is the uh, most elaborated uh, representative of Roman Catholic theology after the Council of Trent, the more systematizer. And uh, in doing so, um, 
not only systematizing the canons and, and decrees of the Council of Trent, but also developing them in a anti-Protestant tone and language and arguments in a controversialist way, as they used to call this type of theologizing. So uh, I will leave then at the end of my paper opportunity for you to uh, ask questions or to uh, comment on various aspects of the um, of the paper. And uh, Bellarmine's critique of Protestantism, revisiting the controversy between Tridentine, Roman Catholicism, and the Reformation. Um, Bellarmine was born in Tuscany in 1542. He became a Jesuit in 1560 when he was 18, 18 years of age. His theological preparation was carried out in the Jesuit college in Padova, northeast of Italy, where he was trained in the Thomist tradition, which would become his primary school of thought and of which he would become a staunch promoter. In Padova, he also developed his skills as humanist well-versed in classical studies and biblical languages. As a brilliant young scholar, he was sent to Louvain, Leuven, in what is now Belgium, to complete his studies in that prestigious university city. He did so well academically that he soon became professor of theology there. He went there as a student and he was then called to be a professor. In Leuven, he met his, the only embodied Protestants that he had never met in his life. He talked about Protestantism, he talked about Protestant theology, he read extensively the reformers, but it was only in Leuven that he actually met some of them in person. Uh, being Leuven next to the Spanish Low Countries, it was with Calvinism in particular that Bellarmine took issue in his preaching and teaching there. In 1576, Bellarmine was called back to Italy by Pope Gregory XIII, this time to Rome, to take hold of, a ch of the chair of controversies at the Roman College of the Eternal City. The chair had already been established by Ignatius of Loyola himself in 1555 to be a reference point for the training of priests and religious people coming from and returning to regions where Protestantism had become a threat for Rome. Pope Gregory had made provisions for 150 students from Germany and around 50 students from England to be trained to become uh, the novos milites, the new soldiers in the battle. In view of expanding the influence of the chair, the Pope called Bellarmine to the task of providing a top class theological training for them. You can see here the signature of Robert Cardinal Bellarmine when he was then uh, nominated a cardinal. He soon received pressures to make his material available in book form for wider circulation and to have it as a reference tool for priests and Catholic intellectuals around Europe. And I have listed here the courses that he taught at the Roman College during his Roman years. 1576, on the word of God, traditions, church and councils, following here on the Roman pontiff and priesthood, 
following here on monks, clergy, laity, and purgatory. Then on the saints, grace and sin, free will and justification, Christ, the sacrament in, sacraments in general, and the sacrament of the Eucharist. These are, this is the list of courses that he taught in Rome. And he was pressed to publish this material in a book form. And although reluctantly, because um, when he first drafted them, they were not meant to circulate, he labored to prepare his lectures for publication. The outcome of his Leuven and Roman courses eventually came out as the Disputationes, the Controversies Christianae Fidei Adversus Uius Temporis Hereticos, the uh, disputations or the disputes on the controversies over the Christian faith against the heretics of this time. And it was published in three volumes from 1586 to 1593. This work has become the standard Roman Catholic theological rebuttal of the Reformation up to the First Vatican Council. So for three centuries, it has been the main standard Catholic presentation of the Catholic faith with a special apologetic argumentation and anti-Protestant intentionality. The work went through 20 editions published all over Europe, and the last of which was published in Paris in 1870-1874 soon after Vatican I. The magnitude of Bellarmine's work is well captured from a Roman Catholic point of view by an author called Dinesh de Souza when he argues the following. Somehow, and I quote, the faith has to raise great apologists among or during times of crisis. St. Augustine during the fall of Rome. St. Thomas during the Aristotelian revival. Bellarmine helped rescue the faith during the Protestant siege of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries by meeting the theological challenge of the reformers and guiding Catholicism to a new vigor and confidence in the future. After his death, Bellarmine's works were taken by Jesuit missionaries around the world in their efforts to export Roman Catholicism. His Opera Omnia, the complete collection of his works, was again published in Rome in 18. 32, and then in Naples, in eight volumes, in demonstration of the fact that up to the second half of the 19th century, there was still a demand for his writings. Moreover, when discussing the issue of the infallibility of the Pope in preparation to elevate it to a dogma of the Roman Church, Bellarmine's authority was evoked at the First Vatican Council in support of it. His legacy and reputation continued to be honored to the point that well into the 20th century, Pope Pius XI beatified him and canonized him in 1930, eventually declaring Bellarmine a doctor of the Universal Church in 1931. So a very brief sketchy presentation of his life and his works. After being a professor in Rome, Bellarmine was also 
sent to different diplomatic missions around Europe. He was also named a cardinal. And before being named a cardinal, he was sent as a bishop to Capua near Naples. So he blended academic, pastoral, and diplomatic skills. He was one of the brightest minds of his age. And if we uh, look at the various Protestant writings uh, dealing with Trent and Catholicism in general, we find him quoted over and over again by generations of Protestant authors, theologians, and apologists. And up to Hermann Baving himself, if you look at the reform dogmatics, Bellarmine is the often quoted authority of the then Catholicism that Baving was dealing with. So after sketching the importance of Bellarmine in his own time, I would like to uh, talk about one of the most important, I think, contributions that he made in terms of defining, singling out, and deepening the main issue at stake with the Protestant Reformation. Of course, his work is extensive, and we could you know, spend months in discussing all the various issues that he uh, worked on. But I think that one way of singling out what is at stake, what is important, what the most crucial element in Bellarmine's treatment and understanding of Protestantism and the way it related to or conflicted with Roman Catholicism is to look at his uh, uh, work, uh, the disputes or the disputations. The oppositional Roman Catholicism, which had come out of the Council of Trent, found in Bellarmine a thoughtful systematizer and an efficient apologist in the ongoing doctrinal and spiritual war against the Protestant heresies. Bellarmine had so well assimilated the contents of the Council of Trent that he was able then to the unfold what the Council of Trent meant, what was the mind or the spirit of the Council of Trent, even beyond the letter of the decrees and the canons. Uh, in, in so doing, Bellarmine imposed a scholarly pattern to the controversy. In his disputations in this book, he names 7,135 quotations or citations of Protestants, meaning that he had read them carefully and extensively. And uh, he discusses them in their arguments, showing a significant degree of familiarity. More than 200 Protestant works were written in response to Be Bellamy. In rejecting Protestant theology, Bellamy tried to represent it accurately and to understand it from within. So it followed a scholarly pattern, at least working hard on its main sources and authors, painstakingly parsing arguments and providing responses in line with Tridentine theology. In his discussions, he shows familiarity with an impressive number of opposers. The top five Protestant authors that he dealt with are in order Calvin, Chebnitz, Luther, Flacius, Vermigli, and Melanchthon. What is interesting in what is what Bellarmine writes in the preface. Here we find a very important point. The controversy the Roman Catholic Church is engaged with 
is put in historical context and associated with a specific section of the Apostles' Creed. According to Bellarmine, the Reformation is not the first, but only the latest of a series of attacks that the Catholic Church has received throughout the centuries. Bellarmine suggests a parallel between the received attacks and the articles of the creed. In his understanding, in the first two centuries, the enemies tried to destroy the first article of the creed, the reality of one God. And he talks about the Simonians, the Basilidians, and the Martianists. They were trying to destroy Article 1. In the third century, I quote, the devil established a new front and he began to attack the second article of the creed. Through the activities of Praxeas, Noetus, Sabellius, Paul of Samostate, the divinity of Christ was questioned. From the fourth century onward, the mystery of the divine incarnation was attacked, thus impinging in various ways on the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh article because of their interconnections between the person and work of Jesus Christ and the person and work of the Holy Spirit. In this respect, Bellarmine makes reference to Arius, Eunomius, Nestorius, Eutychus, up to the Eastern Schism over the procession of the Spirit. Having established this the order, orderly procedure of the evil attacks to the very fabric of the creed, at this point, Bellarmine can advance his thesis as to how to interpret the threat of the Reformation. The same scheme is applied here. In fact, after trying to destroy the first eight articles, the devil is now dedicated, I quote, to upset and destroy the truths concerning the church and the sacraments. That is, the ninth and the tenth articles of the creed. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, and the forgiveness of sins. Against these articles, different pre-Reformation and Reformation movements are, according to Bellarmine, converging in order to undermine them. And here, here Bellarmine quotes the Berengarians, the Waldensians, the Albigensians, the Wycliffites, the Hussites, the Lutherans, the Swinglians, the Confessionists, and the Anabaptists. The whole spectrum of medieval and early modern Reformation groupings is apparently united against the doctrine of the church and the sacraments. Here is Bellarmine's contention, and I quote, since almost all of the heiresses of the present time pertain to these two articles of the Apostles' Creed, the ninth and the tenth, we will also di direct all the, these controversies to these two articles. Here we should pause for a moment in the attempt to appreciate the point that Bellarmine is making and perhaps to try to critically assess it. The Jesuit theologian is well aware of the differences between the different strands of the Reformation, yet he views them as unitarily allied in their common front against the Roman Church and its sacraments. Then he singles out the ninth and the tenth articles as the crux of the matter. The heart of the controversy between Rome and the Reformation lies in these two articles. While on the first eight ones there is no apparent quarrel nor controversy, it is on the church and the sacraments that the conflict lies. Renaming the list in more technical terms, we could say that while on theology proper, 
Christology, pneumatology, and therefore the basic Trinitarian framework of the Christian faith, there is no significant distinction, no division. It is in the area of ecclesiology and soteriology that the, that the battles that the battle rages. According to this interpretation, the Reformation did not take issue with Rome on the creedal and Trinitarian foundation of the Christian faith, but only on the two theological outworkings of it, that is, the church and salvation. However, his argument whereby the heart of the Roman Catholic Protestant war lies in the ninth and tenth articles of the creed needs to be qualified by the way he sets out to achieve his apologetical goal. In having to treat the subject matter of article nine, that is the church, the first thing to be treated is Christ himself. This is Bellerin speaking or writing. The first thing to be treated is Christ himself, who is the head and prince of the whole church. On the one hand, then, the core issue for Bellarmine is the church. But on the other, Bellarmine himself acknowledges the fact that the church is organically related to Christ. And therefore, by extension, ecclesiology to Christology. In other words, Article 9 on the Church theologically outgrows the preceding articles. They are not detached or independent articles. Article 9 outgrows the preceding ones. Whereby the Catholic Protestant controversy becomes apparent in Article 9, it ultimately lies in the whole Christological and therefore Trinitarian framework of the creed. Bellarmine, while on the one hand affirms the fact that the controversy is rooted in Article 9 and 10, on the other hand, he acknowledges that Article 9 and 10 do not stand on their own. They are developments, outworkings of the preceding articles. And if the conflict becomes apparent at Article 9 and 10, the root of the conflict needs to be traced back in the preceding articles. Bellarmine here shows theological acuteness in not taking doctrines or the articles of the creed in isolation, but correlating them in a system of doctrine. While he wants to address the Protestant heresies related to the church, he must deal with their foundational root, that is, Christology given the fact that ecclesiology is argued for in primarily Christological terms. This is the reason why he devotes an entire book of more than 300 pages on the topic of Christ, the head of the church, interbowing Christology and ecclesiology. A similar move is done by Berlamin when it comes to introducing his train of arguments related to Article 10, the remission of sin or the forgiveness of sin. In outlining what he is about to write, soteriology is presented as embedded in a doctrinal web, including, and I quote, the grace of the first man the loss of grace, the wounds remaining from sin, the recovery of grace, free will, justification, the merit of good works. The doctrinal discourse on the remission of sins involves 
the grace of God, therefore, the doctrine of God, the nature and effects of sin, and therefore, the doctrine of sin, the nature of man, and therefore, anthropology. Art Article 10, in other words, is the tip of a theological iceberg that is unthinkable outside of a much larger framework explicitly touching on all the pillars of the creed. To further reinforce the same point, a third comment by Berlamin in his preface is worth quoting. He is aware that the controversy centered on the articles 9 and 10 is further encapsulated in another preceding controversy. That is, and I quote, the word of God. In other words, Bellarmine is aware that the point of difference also has to do with a different epistemological reference frameworks of the two theology. And uh, this uh, framework needs to be established in order to understand what is at stake between the two factions. The rule of faith is the doctrinal standard by which one can make a judgment about dogmas. Here again, while affirming that the battle line is primarily in ecclesiology and soteriology, Bellarmine argues that the doctrine of revelation, the Bible, tradition, the role of the magisterium of the church, all these doctrines are intrinsically involved in the dispute. This is why Bellarmine devotes its first controversy more than 250 pages to the word of God. That's the first chapter of the disputations, the word of God, followed by Christ, and then moving on to the church and the sacrament. So on the one hand, and I repeat the point, he claims or he argues or suggests that the battle line lies in article 9 and 10. But he is a well, uh, it is an intelligent theologian, being aware of the fact that Article 9 and 10 do not stand on their own legs, so to speak. They are outworkings of the preceding articles. So, are Articles 9 and 10 of the Creed the main issues at stake between Tridentine, Rome, and the Protestant Reformation, question mark. According to Bellarmine, yes and no. At the same time, very Catholic. Yes, because it is there that the contrast becomes more evident and sharp. And he wants to address those in detail. The contrast is there more evident and sharp. But at the same time, no, because ecclesiology and soteriology are organically and inextricably related to the core of their respective theological systems. If the problems arise in ecclesiology, there must be a more fundamental and underlying departure in Christology pneumatology, theology proper, the Trinity, revelation, anthropology, and Amart theology. It is, common, it is a common argument in our present day assessment of the issue at stake between Rome and the evangelical faith that what really divides us has to do with ecclesiology and soteriology. And this claim has a long history. 
going back to Bellarmine, who actually introduced it. But what present day simplistic accounts of the difference uh, fails to do is to be is to have awareness of the fact that behind and through these two main apparent points of conflict and contrast there are whole theologies involved bellarmine's controversies do not support a naive view whereby we can separate the Trinity, Christology, Anthropology, Amartyology, and Ecclesiology and Soteriology. Although they indicate the importance of Articles 9 and 10, they invite us to dig deeper, much deeper, and they strongly argue that the creed as a whole is received, believed, and applied differently by Rome and the Reformation, in spite of formal points of agreement. I think the point is sufficiently clear, and Bellarmine, Bellarmine does a great job in expounding what he actually sets out to do in the preface by way of developing entire books on these issues. And I end up with a few final remarks on um, what we can say about Bellarmine today. Writing at the beginning of the 20th century, the French scholar Joseph Turmel argued, and I quote, that the controversies is for the theologian what the lines on the map are for the geographer. The history of theology after Leo X, the Pope who excommunicated Luther, comes to us in two moments, where one studies it before or after Bellarmine. is a watershed theologian in the Roman Catholic account of the Christian faith in relationship or over against the Reformation. While this is certainly feasible, we live in another age than that of Bellarmine. Much water has flown under the bridges of Rome, from Trent to Vatican II, from Clement VIII to Pope Francis. Although, 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 Pope Francis is a Jesuit like Bellarmine was, and who together with his present day ecumenical attitude has also expressed harshly critical assessment of the Reformation in the past. I don't have time here to develop this, but Bergoglio, when he was the Jesuit rector of a Jesuit school in Buenos Aires delivered a series of lectures on the history of the Jesuits, uh, presenting a very critical, very Bellarmine critique of Protestantism, um, especially against Luther and even more so against Calvin. I end with a quote by Another Jesuit, present-day Jesuit, Cardinal, former Lutheran, becoming Catholic, Avery Dallas, who passed away maybe 10 years ago, an American Jesuit. And Avery Dallas says this. The Council of Trent issued what still stands as the authoritative statement of Catholic doctrine in response to the reformers. The Council of Trent set the agenda for Bellarmine's generation in much the same way as Vatican II has set the agenda for the late 20th century. 
think the Catholic Church is waiting for a new Bellarmine or a different Bellarmine to deal with the Protestant faith of our day. Thank you very much.